Good evening everyone and welcome to this CPD workshop titled EPC Awareness Understanding a Domestic EPC. So the learning objectives for this workshop include understand what is displayed on an EPC, understand and explain how the EPC has been produced, use recommendations displayed on the EPC constructively, identify common issues with an EPC, and be confident in dealing with queries regarding an EPC. Hopefully, following this evening's content, these learning objectives will become clear to you all. In order to achieve these learning objectives, the presentation tonight will be split into four sections. So section one, we will look at what is an EPC. Section two, we will look at the different elements of an EPC. Section three, we will look at the recommendations held within an EPC. And section four, we will look at EPC use for the trades. There will also be an opportunity following the presentation for any questions that you may have. So, section one, what is an EPC? For those of you who have never seen an EPC before, this is what the front page and some would say the most important page of an EPC looks like. This front page is what should be displayed in all properties where it can be seen next to the electric meter or next to the boiler. You will see there is a great deal of information on this page, including chart, texts and figures. But what exactly is it? EPCs or Energy Performance Certificates are the UK's solution to measure and certify the energy performance of dwellings. EPCs provide information on how energy efficient a building is and how it could be improved. Buildings are rated on a scale from A to G, with A being the most efficient. Each EPC is required to include an energy performance indicator and cost effective recommendations. So as you will see, have seen from the front page of the EPC you saw earlier, this coloured chart is the energy efficiency rating or energy performance indicator. You can see it has a chart from G up to A in green. It shows the current energy efficiency rating of the dwelling and the potential energy efficiency rating of the dwelling. The energy efficiency rating provides a simple to follow scale of the performance of a building. It also indicates the potential energy efficiency rating should measures be taken to improve the building's performance. So when is an EPC required? An EPC is required any time a landlord rents a property or any time a homeowner sells a property. EPCs must be available for potential tenants or buyers before the property is marketed for rent or sale. This type of EPC is known as a domestic EPC. An EPC is also required for any newly constructed property. So EPCs must be produced for all new built dwellings. This type of EPC is called an on-construction EPC. <clears throat> so what are the differences between a domestic EPC and an on-construction EPC? As mentioned, a domestic EPC is required whenever a property is to be rented or sold at the marketing stage. Basically, 
a domestic EPC involves existing dwellings. The software used to calculate a domestic EPC is called RDSAP, or Reduced Data Standard Assessment Procedure, and is of course a government approved calculation methodology. In order to gather the required information to be input into the RDSAP software, a non-invasive survey must be carried out. Non-invasive meaning no actions which are detrimental to the property should occur during the survey, such as the removal of plasterboard in order to measure insulation. The surveyor must therefore gather information either visibly or through information previously disclosed about the property, such as installation certificates. Assumptions do often have to be made due to the non-invasive nature of the procedure. These assumptions rely on the surveyor's knowledge and experience in the field, as well as building component information gathered through years of research by the Building Research Establishment, or the BRE for short. As also previously mentioned, an on-construction EPC is required any time a new dwelling is built and focuses solely on new dwellings. The software used to calculate an on-construction EPC is Full Standard Assessment Procedure, or just simply SAP in short. As an on-construction EPC requires information input on a brand new dwelling, all design information such as U-value calculations, windows and doors installed, heat sources and renewables are known and can therefore be entered into the software without any survey and simply using a specification. The on-construction EPC would be generated before completion is granted on the new property. We are of course this evening focusing on a domestic EPC for the rental and buying or selling market, although it is useful to know the differences between the two. So how is an EPC generated? All information and data collected from survey is added into a government approved calculation engine. A rating is then produced on the property. It is worth noting that no occupancy related data is added to the calculation and the software assumes occupancy based on the floor area, which could perhaps lead to some inaccuracies of data output. As I know in my household, for instance, my better half always has the heating turned up full, but this may not be the case in all properties. There are, however, suggestions that in the future, occupancy related data could be included within the software. Recommendations are generated based on the dwelling characteristics which have been input into the software. These recommendations are, of course, based on the dwelling characteristics which have been input within, to the, within the software. So in what scenarios is a domestic EPC required? A domestic EPC is required for any self-contained, separately approached domestic dwelling. Self-contained meaning a property with its own kitchen and bathroom facilities, which are not shared. And separately approached meaning a property with its own private access into the dwelling or its own front door. There are some exceptions to EPC requirements and occasions where an EPC may not be required. These include standalone dwellings with a footprint less than 50 metres squared, temporary buildings that will be used for less than two years, residential buildings which are intended to be used for less than four months of the year, such as holiday lets, buildings which have a demolition order against them, and sometimes but not always listed buildings, which is a strange and often confusing area. 
So why exactly are listed buildings often a confusing topic regarding EPC requirements? In Scotland, it is actually nice and easy, as all listed buildings in Scotland require an EPC and are subject to regulations. In England and Wales, however, things are a little different. As the energy performance of buildings, England and Wales Regulations 2012 state that an EPC is not required for buildings officially protected as part of a designated environment or because of their special architectural or historic merit, insofar as compliance with certain minimum energy performance requirements would unacceptably alter their character or appearance. This is, however, still an unclear issue, as in order to assess if measures would unacceptably alter the character or appearance of a listed building, an EPC would still have to be generated in order to view the suggested recommendations and then discussed with a planning officer in order to establish if these potential measures could go ahead. It's certainly an area which needs further clarity in my opinion, but is, however, only an issue in England and Wales. So, that brings us on to a brief summary of Section 1. What is an EPC? EPCs are a solution to demonstrate the energy performance of buildings, in this case, domestic dwellings. There are two types of EPC, domestic EPC and on construction EPC. Domestic EPCs use the reduced data SAP methodology. On construction EPCs use the full SAP methodology. Domestic EPCs are required for rent or sale of a property and are of course required at market and stage. There, some, there are some exceptions to EPC requirements. The next section, section two, will look at each element of the EPC. As you saw at the very beginning of the presentation, the front page of the EPC is often considered the most important, and this is the page that should be displayed within the property. An EPC is, however, actually a six-page document, and that front page is in fact only a condensed summary of the full document. The information held deeper within the full document includes further details of the current energy performance of the dwelling, estimated costings and recommendations for improvement of the dwelling, further detailed information on each recommended measure, which is made easy to understand for the tenant, the landlord or the homeowner, contact details on the energy assessor who carried out the survey and assessment, and even contact details on the organisations who can assist with queries or offer advice on funding to carry out some of the recommended measures. So let's look at each element in a little more detail. The very first thing on display at the top of the cover page is the dwelling information. Here you can see the dwelling address, which I have blanked out in this case purely for privacy. The dwelling type, which could be mid-terrace, semi-detached, detached, bungalow or a flat. The date of the assessment and also the certification date, which is the date the EPC was lodged on the General Government Register. The total floor area as calculated during the survey, the annual energy consumption, the unique reference number or RRN of the particular certificate relating to the property, the type of assessment, in this case being RDSA, 
the approved organisation who certify the energy assessor carrying out the assessment. And finally, the main heating and fuel source. So already a great deal of information on the property in just that small initial section. Next on the front page of the EPC is estimated energy costs of the dwelling in pounds, as well as the estimate of money which could be saved if the, recommendation, the recommendations listed later in the pro report are carried out. This is then split down into further detail, including broken down costs on the third page of the EPC. Next, on the front page of the EPC, as we have already come across, is the energy efficiency rating, which, as you already know, shows the current and potential energy ratings for the dwelling. It's worth noting that in 2018, new regulations were introduced, meaning landlords could only rent out their property to potential tenants if the dwelling had an energy efficiency rating of E or better. If the dwelling's energy efficiency rating falls below the level E, improvement measures must be carried out to increase the rating before new tenants can take on the property. We are, of course, still well within the window where these new regulations are affecting landlords and their properties and improvement works are required. You will also see a further chart on the front page of the EPC. This chart highlights the current and potential environmental impact rating of the dwelling. Where the energy efficiency rating considers both the energy efficiency and the fuel costs of the dwelling, the environmental impact rating only considers the effect of the dwelling on the environment in terms of carbon dioxide or CO2 emissions, and with no financial consideration to the home occupier. Again, the chart issues a rating from A to G with A having the least impact on the environment. Next, on the second page of the EPC, you will find a summary of the energy related features of the dwelling. This table is again generated from the survey information entered into the software and breaks the dwelling into individual elements and issues a star rating out of five based on how these elements are currently performing in terms of both energy efficiency and also environmental impact. This table simply offers a further visual representation of the current rating of the dwelling before any improvement works are carried out. The next very useful piece of information is held on the third page of the EPC, and this is the section on recommendations for improvement. These recommendations are generated by the software based on the survey information entered. The recommendations are listed along with approximate costs as well as potential annual savings. The potential energy and environmental ratings following works completion are also noted. It's worth highlighting that the cost savings and ratings are cumulative, meaning it is assumed the measures are carried out in the order noted within the document. We will take a closer look at these recommendations in the next section. You will also see at the bottom of the page contact details for Home Energy Scotland who are part of the Energy Saving Trust and can be contacted for any advice you may require. The fourth page of the EPC continues to provide information on the recommended measures outlined on the previous page. Here, there is in-depth advice on the specific recommendations, as well as contact details of organisations who can assist in funding for works or certification. This section can be useful for the home occupier in order to provide further information on the measures which have been recommended for improvement within the EPC.
Page 5 of the EPC again contains some important information in the form of the contact details of the energy assessor who surveyed the property and generated the EPC. Again, this is blanked out for privacy, but you can see it contains the assessor's name, the assessor's membership number, the company trading name and address where they are based, as well as the phone number and email address of the energy assessor. The energy assessor should be contacted if there are any queries relating to the calculation itself or the output which is displayed on the EPC. The energy assessor could also be contacted should the homeowner wish to update their energy performance certificate following any improvement works which have taken place. At the bottom of this section, it also mentions the lodgement of the EPC. EPC lodgement is when the EPC is uploaded to a central database and it is at this point and only this point that the EPC becomes an official document and the RRN or unique reference number is generated. So that now brings us to a summary of section 2, elements of an EPC. The front page of the EPC should be displayed in the tenant or client's home next to the electric meter, boiler or plant room. All pages of the EPC contain, contain important information regarding current energy efficiency, energy consumption, energy costs, possible improvements and resources to assist both practically and financially with potential improvements. The document itself is not an official EPC until lodged on the National Register. The energy assessor's contact details and accreditation details are present should a query arise on the calculation of the energy performance certificate. The next section, section 3, will look at the recommendations for improvement listed within the EPC. The Energy Performance Certificate does not only provide details of the current state of the dwelling, but also offers options to help improve the dwelling's EPC rating and energy efficiency by generating potential improvements through the calculation methodology. The EPC will list a number of applicable energy improvement recommendations which would increase the dwelling's EPC rating as well as provide potential savings involved through implementation of these recommendations. Recommendations are based only on home improvements and not on occupancy behaviour. So, as you have already seen, it is this table on the third page of the EPC where the recommendations and associated information can be found. In the first section here on the left hand side, you can see the listed improvement measures. You can then see the estimated costs of the works. Next, you will see the potential annual savings Following this, the table notes the potential energy efficiency rating following works And finally, you can see the potential environmental impact rating following works In total, there are 31 different improvement recommendations within the SAP methodology. Each recommendation is hard coded and specified by the software itself, therefore can only be altered through a change within the data input. Each of the 31 possible improvement measures will be considered for each and every EPC that is completed but only those eligible for the building in question will be included within the report. 
As long as all the criteria for a recommendation is met by the software methodology, the recommendation will be included within the report. It is worth noting, however, recommendations would need to make at least one SAP point difference to be included, or would need to make an annual cost saving of at least £10 in order to be included. The EPC will not include recommendations which would only see a very marginal improvement. So, a very brief summary of section 3, looking at the recommendations contained within the EPC. Based on the dwelling's assessed characteristics, the EPC will generate recommendations to help improve the energy efficiency of the building in question. Recommendations are generated based on the in situ features of the dwelling, as well as their cost and benefit to the dwelling. The recommendations must be completed in turn in order for the predicted benefit to be, in, to be achieved. The costs and also the savings of the recommendations are indicative, meaning work should not be based solely on these figures. This now brings us on to section 4. EPC use for the trades. So how can a tradesperson use an EPC? Please firstly bear in mind that not every tenant, landlord or homeowner will understand what an EPC is or even know the first thing about it. Therefore, after tonight, you can hopefully explain what an EPC is and how it relates to the dwelling in question, offer information on energy efficiency improvements using the recommendations listed on the EPC, give estimate, estimated costings based on the guidelines noted within the recommendations section of the EPC, Point the tenant or homeowner in the right direction of where funding can be accessed in order to pay for these improvements. And of course, carry out the improvement works noted within the EPC. So what next? How can you assist the tenant or homeowner after you have carried out the works? You could recommend further works as set out within the EPC. You could assist in finding another tradesperson to carry out more measures listed within the EPC. You could recommend the tenant or homeowner has a new EPC calculated in order to reflect the works which have been carried out. Or you could assist in finding an energy assessor to offer further in-depth guidance on the next steps to take. Now, if you're going to assist the homeowner to understand the content of the EPC and carry out some works recommended within the EPC, you'll almost certainly come up against some queries from either the tenant, the landlord or the homeowner. I have therefore put together the answers to some common queries which you may be asked. An EPC only becomes valid upon lodgement to the central register, as we've already discussed. Each EPC is valid for 10 years from the date of lodgement. Changes in regulations may mean that anticipated EPC improvements are not met if there has been regulation changes between the initial EPC creation, the recommendations being carried out, and the new EPC produced. So what if you cannot find an EPC in the home and no one is able to help you find it? Every household should, should have a valid EPC displayed somewhere within the dwelling. 
But if this is not the case, all lodged EPCs are searchable on the central register. You will find that central register either on the English and Welsh website at www.epcregister.com or on the Scottish website at www.scottishepcregister.org.uk. You can search using either the property postcode or the unique reference number or RRN. All historical APCs lodged for a property are available to view on the register. Now what if you don't know the answer to a query? If you're asked a question regarding an EPC which you do not know the answer to and is not held within the EPC itself, contact the Energy Assessor in the first instance. The Energy Assessor's full contact details are of course noted within page 5 of the EPC. Queries relating to the validity or results contained within an EPC should again be referred to the Ener Energy Assessor in the first instance. Okay, thank you very much for your time. That brings me to the end of the presentation itself. Hopefully I have covered all of the learning objectives we set out, including understand what is displayed on an EPC, understand and explain how the EPC has been produced, use recommendations displayed on the EPC constructively, identify common issues with an EPC, and be confident in dealing with queries regarding an EPC. Thank you again for your time. As I mentioned um, early on in the presentation, if you have any queries, um, please feel free to contact me on the contact details I gave. Um, otherwise, I'm sure that the slides will be made available for your use in future. Thank you.